Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Joe Lampo will be with us. But first, a message from our good friends at Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or thousands of miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb knowledge required. Gardening makes gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to go from seed to harvest. Um, from healthy and to the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, get your Rise Garden. Visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Joel Ample is not only an experienced gardener, but an author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hey, Holly. Hey, Joey. It's good to be back. Well, we're always happy when you take time out of your obviously very busy schedule to uh, join us on the program and, and enlighten your knowledge on all of us and our listeners. And we thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So let, let's ask, I'm going to ask the obvious question for people who watch the program and see your raised beds and then they're like, oh, uh, and then they look in their backyard. How do you get enough compost for your raised beds? How do you supplement that or where, where do you get that? And how do you keep your soil productive and fed year after year once you've obtained that compost? Yep. I, I make a lot of compost. And so uh, I've got three, three bin pallet system. So basically nine bays where I'm always making compost and it's either fresh compost, it's in process or it's finished. So I've always got a finished source somewhere in that nine bin system. And that's what I use to supplement my raised beds every year. And I do it twice a year. I just top dress it one inch of compost, finished compost at the beginning of the summer crop going in so basically after i pull my cool season crops out which i can sometimes overwinter and get an early spring crop but before i plant my summer crops i'm i'm top dressing and then i do it again in august when i'm pulling out some of my warm season stuff to make room for my cool season when i have that blank slate in between i'm top dressing again and and that's it i let the microbes and the soil food web bring everything down in and I don't overdo it because once you get your beds good and filled with organic material, you don't, you know, you just need to top dress it. You don't, a little bit goes a long way, I guess, is the moral of the story. Now, in order to fill those beds, did you didn't make all that compost. You had to bring some of that in, didn't you, like many of us? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. That was a lot of compost initially. So I had to, I had to find a good source for that. And that's the hard part, you know, but fortunately I was able to do it, but you know, you just got to do your homework before you make that kind of investment of money and space in your garden beds for questionable compost. You need to make sure you're getting good stuff before it's delivered. And, and and like many things in life, you pay for what you get. If it's expensive, there's probably a reason why it's expensive. And if yes. it's El Cheapo, there's probably a reason why it's El Cheapo. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100% every time. Now you're in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Are you able to grow virtually year round or, or are you, is there a, a stopping point for you? Uh, I'm, I'm able to go year round with the, the more hardy, cool season crops, but I can get well past our, our first frost date of the fall with pretty much all my brassicas. Cause you know, they're loving the frost anyway. And, um, many of them will go, you know, until they start bolting in the spring. Mm-hmm. So if I haven't harvested them yet, like kale is a good example, you know, it, it just goes and spinach is another one. And now they're all going to seed, but I ha- I never pulled them out and I've been harvesting nonstop. So that's amazing. That is amazing. So what is a major plant disease that you have dealt with frequently or just had dealt with once and you just have a really good handle on it and how did you get rid of it or control it? Well, I'll tell you one that's a, Maybe, I mean, uh, to me, all the diseases are pretty challenging because they're very persistent and they're everywhere and they come in from the air or in the soil. But one that I struggle with every year is fusarium wilt, which is a soil borne disease that shows up initially with yellow coloration on one side of the branch or one side of the plant, like tomatoes, for example. That's a very susceptible plant to it. And as a soil borne disease, it's really the only way that you can deal with it because there is no consumer-grade solution for it. 
You have to rotate your crops. And, the, and in the equivalent in the north where you guys are would be like verticillium wilt. So both of these are soil-borne diseases. They show up with yellow coloration on the foliage. Verticillium works its way from the bottom up across the plant. Fusarium, like I have, kind of is one-sided with the yellow, and then it kind of makes its way across the plant. But they pretty much act the same. And the only way that you can really work through it is to rotate your crops from the same family out of that soil environment for at least three years up to 10. But, you know, the the realistic way for a homeowner is to maybe three to five years not plant back in that same spot. And the way that I deal with that is I use grow bags and I just I don't even plant in other beds because all my beds have been planted with something in the tomato family uh, pretty much every year. So the only way I get away from it and rotate and let those pathogens starve out is to find some place else to plant anything in the in the solanaceae family so the tomatoes peppers eggplants and potatoes don't go back in that bed for three to five years and i use grow bags as my alternative place to plant boy that's got to be tough you see that bed empty you're like man i should plant there but you know you can't I can't plant tomatoes back there or yeah. peppers, that's for sure. I try to find something that's not in the family and make use of it, but I can't go back with those those solanaceous crops. Now, you are obviously someone who is able to be in the garden more frequently than the average person. For people who are not able to be in that in their garden as frequently as, as they would like, what are some of your best weeding control tips if you can only get in the garden a couple hours a week or maybe every other week? Mulch. The, my single answer, mulch, um, two inches of mulch. Like I have it in my garden pathways between my beds, a uh, hardwood, un, un, untreated, non-dyed, natural hardwood mulch. And, um, you know, I mean, you could use Arbor's wood chips for free, but whatever you use, if you can block the sunlight to the soil surface, you're going to reduce significantly the number of weed seeds that are going to germinate there. Now they're still going to, you're still going to have weeds because they're going to wash in from runoff. And, you know, if your garden's downhill from someplace that wash out into your garden is going to bring with it weed seeds and they're going to germinate even in the mulch, but they will be easier to pull out. But if you can deny sunlight to the soil surface and mulch is the easiest way to do that. And as it breaks down, it improves your soil. Even when you have weeds, they're easier to pull. So this part two of it is when you see weeds, take a few minutes a week uh, and just pull out the ones you see. I mean, it's, it only takes a few minutes and then you stay ahead of it. The worst thing is when you start getting overwhelmed because you haven't taken the time to pull out the ones that pop up. And eventually that catches up with you and then it becomes a daunting eyesore task that you've got to deal with it they're not going away you've got to get them out of there and the mulch will help with that so mulching and pulling right and and you don't use chemicals we don't use chemicals but about right. t- 10 years ago there was a very popular garden show it's no longer on the air and he was talking about how he accidentally sprayed the one weed killing chemical in the garden and it was the best thing he ever did and he would encourage people to do that just don't get it around your edible plants you can just you don't have to weed anymore He's not on the air anymore, and that's what the problem is for people like you and us who are trying to get the right information out. This stuff is stuck in their head from these people who are just trying to get whatever you want, you know, add, you know, clicks and and subscribers and listeners. We're trying to tell the real thing, and they're they're just saying whatever they need to say in order to get people to listen. Yeah, and that's very bad advice because in addition to just the fact that it's bad stuff, the drift from it, mm-hmm. it will get on those plants, and it only takes – you know, a billionth of a particle or whatever. It's just very minute and it can really do damage if not kill your plants. And so, you're breathing it in too. We're correct. Yeah, that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if it doesn't get to your plants, it might get to your neighbor's plants and that's not good either. Yeah. 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 Your uh, newest book came out last fall, the ve- the vegetable gardening book, Your Complete Guide to Growing an Edible Organic Garden from Seed to Harvest. What is something in that book that would encourage our encourage our listeners to pick up a copy, whether they are a newer gardener or more experienced gardener, anywhere along the line? Yeah. Okay. So let's just say they're an experienced gardener. I love talking to gardeners at all levels because I feel like we all have something 
to share. And there's always more to learn. And you're not going to know it all, and I'm not going to know it all, but I'm always learning. And it's often coming from other people. Even though I do this for a living and I've been doing it for three decades plus, I'm always learning. So for the for for me or the experienced person, my book is probably potentially new information to them. But for the newer gardener, imagine that what just imagine if you could have somebody as a mentor or a guide in your garden that's kind of looking over your shoulder and talking to you like a friend and the two of you are in the garden one on one learning and gardening together. Well, I wrote this book with that in mind so that somebody reading that book would feel like, God, I feel like Joe's talking to me and I feel like we're kind of in the garden together. And so it's casual, it's informal, but it's very informative. It's all science-based. It's not too heady. So it's easy to comprehend. And yet the information you need to know is there. And I, and I say it this way, I am a big believer in teaching you the why do behind the how to. So it's okay. It's good to know how to do something, but I think it's more important to know why you need to do the steps to make that happen so that you can apply that information to other things. You know, it's not just following a recipe. It's chefing your way through the meal. You know, it's, it's, it's because you, you've got this knowledge of what works and what doesn't and, and why it works or why it doesn't that you can apply without feeling like you can only follow a, a series of predetermined steps. And so that's what my book was intended to feel like all the way through. And it covers start to finish soup to nuts, taking you through the entire process of how to set up a garden, lay it out, think about placement of your plants, the soil, the mulch, the the top 40 plants that you probably are going to grow if you're growing a vegetable garden between warm and cool season crops and how to grow each of those step by step. So there's a lot there. And, uh, you know, I fit in as much as I could in the, in the pages that they allowed me to have to write the book. So it's packed with information. Fantastic. And I think in this age of technology, you can get information that's like, this is how you do X, Y, Z, but not everybody yeah. explains the the why. Why do you no. do X, Y, Z? And I think no. that there's a lack of that with all the technology and information that we have. So it's yeah. really important. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. If you want to be serious about improving your craft or your skill, you, you just got to know more than just the steps. I mean, that's just a recipe card. You need to know the reasoning behind it. And that's how you get better. I couldn't agree more. So we are talking with Joe Lampo, gardener, author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. There are so many garden tools out there. What are some, What are the main ones every gardener should have, and what are the ones that they should be avoiding? I'm thinking about what I would walk out my garden with almost every time, and it would be my, my sheath that holds my pruners and my soil knife. So those are two things right there. And, and I almost feel naked walking out without them. I mean, I, I have them by my door coming in and out towards the garden. And I grab those every time, put them on my hip, and then I'm always reaching for them, whether it's you know pruning a branch or, or using my soil knife to dig a hole to plant something or maybe scrape out some weeds or you know dig something out of the lawn or cut some twine. I mean, gosh, there's a million things I do with just those two tools. And then one more that I... Every time I'm in the garden, I, I have, you know, those rubber, they used to be called tub trucks, but now they're called gorilla tubs. Yes. They're, they're rubberish, handled, strong, nice colors, come in different sizes, big, large pails, rubber pails. Those things, I, I just love them. I, I have, I probably have 12 of them scattered around and for weeding, for hauling in mulch, for um, carrying loads of organic matter into your beds, for moving compost out of your bin into the beds, for filling it with, like for me, a quick way to fertilize my garden beds with my fish emulsion is to fill up one of those big tub trucks with the water and the dilution and then take my watering can and plunge it into the the big tub and it's instantly filled and then I can go around the garden and, you know, apply it to my plants and come back and refill it, you know, five or six times before I have to make up another big batch versus individually, you know, doing your one gallon watering can or something like that. Every time you have to refill it, that's, that's way more time 
than just doing it one time in a big tub truck for like five or six rounds. So those three things are I think things that every gardener should have, no matter how long they've been gardening or how new they are, those are things you can't go wrong with. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us. How can people, where should people go to find your books? Where should people go to find the show and and what you're offering? Yeah, I think joegardner.com is the single one place that probably will get you everywhere else and show you all the things that I'm doing with the podcast and the online gardening Academy and uh, the videos and you know, whatever I have going on, it's probably on the website somewhere. There's a link for it from there. And Growing a Grand World, check your local PBS station for times and availability in your market. Yep. We appreciate the time, Joe, and the information you've shared with us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, guys. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.